Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here while I'm waiting to see some more people. Uh, I'm gonna show up face to face. Um, so yeah, I still am kind of um, uh, recording these and posting these after the fact for our blended course here. Um, oh, before I begin, I just posted this announcement, um, but um, uh, I mentioned this maybe once before or twice before. Um, you know, I, I just wanted everybody to kind of remember there is a, a course on neural networks and deep learning uh, in spring. Uh, it makes a really natural companion to this one because we pick up kind of right where this one left off. And in fact, you know, if you've been looking at our textbook, uh, our hands-on machine learning textbook, uh, there are some uh, materials, some chapters on there for uh, neural networks, not to mention the whole second half is really about TensorFlow. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, so for the uh, deep learning neural networks course, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it makes a really good kind of uh, next course after this one because, because you know, the, the things that you learn uh, about machine learning here um, really help you understand the neural network stuff. So um, I can uh, get you guys permission in order to use that as the second course for the track. So we don't always list that in our degree plans for the, the um, master's degree. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, machine learning and uh, the neural networks course uh, can, can be your two courses to complete the track for the, uh, what's it called? The machine, lear the machine learning AI track, basically, right? So um, um, I actually do use a different textbook, um, a, a textbook um, um, by the author of the Keras library, which is one of the two. So, so PyTorch and Keras are two of the, the Python libraries, the, the, the big ones that people use for deep learning. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I really like the textbook, but we go through, you know, just the basics of deep learning, right? So, you know, if you understood the stuff about um, linear regression and logistic regression, neural networks are an extension of that. So a node in a neural network kind of functions like um, one or a set of parameters for a linear regression. So then a neural network is just combining a bunch of those so as if you have uh, a sequence of linear regressions or logistic regression. So you can get some extra power from doing things like that. So, and then deep learning is uh, another um, uh, thing beyond kind of straightforward neural networks. So uh, it's, anyway, it's one of my favorite courses. Uh, I, I hope you'll uh, think about it. I do need to get a few more people in there. Um, I hope we got four or five right now. But, um, so, All right, um, let's go get started. So my main goal for today um, is I want to kind of finish up talking about assignment four, and then maybe I'll talk a little bit about decision trees and ensembles, um, since I didn't really have uh, kind of a canned lecture video for this or, or for the, the rest of the um, lecture notebooks that we've got um, uh, for, for the end of the course here. So, so yeah, as a reminder, um, assignment four is due. Um, this week, uh, so I guess like Sunday this week here. Um, so, oops, didn't mean to split that. So, I mean, in particular, maybe I'll go back and talk a little bit more about support vector machines um, in general, but um, I, I kind of wanted to talk about kind of the Gaussian kernel stuff, right? Just so this for this, the 1.3 um, that uh, makes certain people are, are fine um, with the stuff that's talked about here. So if, if I didn't make it clear in the class, um, in, in the, uh, the the content on my Leo online, um, so uh, let, me, let me go back here. So. Probably the best things to, to go over. Um, I mean, there was just a, 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 thing, a simple notebook on um, on support vector machines from our hands-on machine learning uh, class, right? But there wasn't a whole lot in there, so it was mostly just some of the examples from the uh, chapter five, right? So definitely, you want to read the chapter five and go over that. But but you know, really, for this material, it would be a good idea if you haven't already to um, go through the Dr. Ng's videos as well on the support vector machines. Okay, so um, 
that is the, the lecture, what, I, what was called lecture seven here, um, support vector machines, right? There's a link in there to his videos. Okay, I thought I'd go over this a little bit here today as well, just to get a little bit deeper into support vector machines and in particular, the, the stuff on kernels that, uh, for this assignment four mostly came from his materials. Um, um, but so he talks probably a lot better than, than I'll uh, get into here about what kernels are in the context of support vector machines and things like that. Okay. Um, all right. I mean, you know, again, I've, I've said it multiple times, uh, but uh, if you haven't made use of Dr. Ng's videos, those are really good to, to look at as well, you know, so maybe do the readings from our textbook first, but then go over and look at his videos on the, the same materials. You know, so he does get into kind of some of the mathematical details um, at times, but um, I think that can be really useful to getting a deeper understanding of these things here. So, okay. Um, so, I mean, if I didn't make it clear before, I mean, support vector machines really are a simple modification of logistic regression. So, so they have this uh, large margin. Uh, so it's a modification of the objective function or the fitness function, basically, right? So just to review, um, so the, the basic modification that we made for logistic regression, and again, this is all coming from Dr. Ring's videos now, mostly here. Um, the, so the basic modification we made for logistic regression um, was, uh, you know, we changed our um, activation function, right? So we squashed it through what this, this thing is called the sigmoid. So if you remember that, so basically that takes any value from, you know, negative infinity to infinity. Uh, and the result is it going to be a value between zero and one, right? Which makes uh, it perfect for an activation function as an output um, if you're trying to do uh, a classification, right? Because remember, a binary classification, basically, because we want to have just two classes, zero and one, right? So we need something that gives us like a zero or one answer or somewhere in between if we're kind of uncertain uh, which way to predict, right? So that's really what the sigmoid does, right? And then the, um, the objective function or the cost function that we did for logistic regression, we, we use the, the, this modification, the log of that sigmoid, uh, of that activate, activation function. Uh, and we multiply it by a y, you know, so this is the, the, the class, right? So, so this, this is re this somewhat review. I don't know if I went into it in real good detail last time. But what this comes out to, so, so this is what we're using for the cost function that we're trying to optimize when we're doing logistic regression, right? Um, and, and we did discuss this a little bit before. So for example, when y is one, when, when you're trying to predict the one, um, you know, one minus y will be zero. So this will go away. So, so you'll only get this term. And so when y is one, y is one here, right? And, and you get a function that looks something like this. And so this makes a good cost function for, um, for our classification because again, remember we're trying to predict one, um, the, the class is one, right? So we want the cost to be low, we want the cost to be zero. So whenever Z is, 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 is a large number, the output is gonna be one by our activation function here. So, so again, when, when Z is large, we, uh, 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 if the correct answer is one, we wanna have a cost of zero. So that's why it's going down to zero here. But if, if, if Z is small, we're gonna be predicting like zero. Right, and we want the cost to be large, and it gets larger and larger the more negative you go here. Right, so that that directly reflects what we want for our cost function. Okay. Um, and vice versa, you know. So, so so this is a binary classification, so we have to do kind of the, the reverse or the mirror of that. So when we're trying to predict zero. So when y is zero, you know, that will zero out this left-hand portion um, and you'll just get this right-hand portion. So you get the mirror of that. And again, this is what you want for the cost function when the value is uh, zero that you're trying to predict, right? So when it's zero, you want the cost to be really low when you have a negative number because you're gonna be make, making a prediction of zero. But if the, the true answer of y is, is zero and you're in, in you know, your Z is high, you're gonna make, be making predictions of one, right? And so you wanna have a, a high cost because you're mispredicting, you're not predicting correctly, right? So the, 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 the full cost function that we were 
um, trying to minimize for logistic regression was this. So it was, this, it was that cost function we just showed up there that we summed over all of the uh, training examples where we have M training examples, right? Plus we added in this regularization term. So we spent two or three kind of weeks talking about regularization. So this is the L1 type of regularization where you just take the square of the um, values instead of the absolute value, right? But, um, but, but you can use, use either of those, L1 or L2. Did I have that backwards? I can never, I can never remember uh, the, the L1 norm or the L2 norm. So anyway, I think it's L2. So um, anyway, so, so that was our basic cost function for logistic regression. And for reasons, this is kind of a nice function. It, it actually, you can take the derivative of, of it pretty easy, which makes it a good function that you can minimize um, with a iterative algorithm like a um, uh, stochastic gradient set, which probably spent, should have spent some more time on that. I hope, hope you guys um, um, read through that material and, and understood about gradient descent in general and, and some of the variations like uh, batch gradient descent and things. Um, so yeah, anyway, you know, so that was our logistic regression function. We're trying to minimize that, right? Oh, so what we do for the, the support vector machine um, cost function is basically the same as the logistic regression, but we use, um, in, instead of the, the log of the sigmoid, I'm missing a parenthesis there, I just noticed. Um, so instead of the log of the sigmoid, we use a, a different form that, we'll, we'll, that, that Dr. Ng talks about in his next video on the large margin int intuition. I'll go into that, right? But, but this, this this function has pretty much the same form as this, the, the, the same purpose, right? So if you understand this intuitively, uh, these are doing the same thing, right? So this is the cost when the true value is one, right? Which for logistic, we used this part here to the left when the true value is one, right? Um, and this is the cost when the true value is zero. Um, now, I talked about a little bit for, for reasons that aren't really worth going into, you know, because historically about how support vector machines were um, built. Um, well, for one thing, you know, we, we kind of get rid of the dividing by M, right? But that doesn't really make a, a, a difference. Um, um, see Dr. Ng's videos if, if you don't know why, but, but you know, so, so, so by, by taking out the divide by M, which is kind of just averaging this cost over the M training examples, um, you know, we kind of remove that for the support vector machine version of it, um, but that didn't, didn't really cause a difference. One, one thing that is a little bit different, again, this doesn't cause a difference in how it works, but uh, uh, we talked about that support vector machines have the parameter called C instead of this um, um, uh, lambda that we use for the regular regularization when we talked about logistic regression and um, linear regression, um, right? So, so basically, instead of putting having C multiplied here instead of lambda over here, C works in the same way, but a high value C means that you're emphasizing the cost and de-emphasizing um, the regularization that, that tends to try to make the model, uh, you know, uh, not overfit, right? Which is kind of the reverse. So, so as he talks about in his uh, video here, you can kind of think of C as the inverse of lambda, uh, like one over lambda. So they kind of work in the reverse way, right? So for logistic regression and linear regression, if you have high lambdas, you are emphasizing regularization, which means that you're trying to uh, keep overfitting, keep, keep overfitting from happening a lot in your model. For support vector machines, if you have a high C, you're emphasizing the, the cost, uh, which means you're emphasizing uh, make, making the model more exact uh, at, at the um, um, with the risk that you could be overfitting, right? By, by kind of reducing or eliminating the regularization, right? That, that tries to fit that overfitting, that tries to fight that overfitting. So. All right. Um, so, so I don't really have time to go into how the, the large margin kind of works, um, but, but uh, although his video here is only 15 or 20 minutes, 
you know, place where you definitely should kind of go look through this. So I'll just kind of cut to the main points of this. So um, um, the, the cost function that we use for support vector machine uh, uses um, this that I kind of incorrectly label as the, um, as a um, um, rectified linear unit. So, so really a rectified linear unit, unit and this are almost the same, but, but this is really actually a hinge function, a hinge loss function um, or hinge activation function here. Okay, because it kind of looks like a hinge. In fact, I might have misused that a little bit, but that's why the default for support vector machines is a hinge function, because it does use this, okay? But this, um, as he talks about in his video, um, um, supports uh, giving, um, uh, for support vector machines, uh, uh, makes the, the, the loss um, so that it emphasizes trying to find good margins. So find, finding a decision boundary that um, maximizes the, the margin, the, the space between the, the things that are the closest to the margin there, right? And, and that, that's kind of one effect that this hinge function um, has here, okay? So this hinge function is really uh, simple, right? Although um, it's not, exactly differentiable. So, so anytime you have a, a function that's not smooth like this, so, so it's not really quite smooth at the point here. Um, but uh, anytime you have a function like this, um, it doesn't quite work uh, as a smooth function to be able to take the derivative of it. But um, that doesn't really matter um, 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 for various reasons that aren't really worth going into here. So you can see that all you have to do to calculate this kind of a, this hinge function is um, um, if, so for this one, this is for when uh, when the true right value is is one, right? So anytime that we have a z of, of one or greater, we, the the function is just defined to be zero. So this is what's known as a piecewise function, right? So where z is um, where z is less than one, so where z is greater than one, we just return a zero. Is what this one is saying here. And where z is less than one, we, we return um, negative z, right? Plus one, right? So, th so that just makes it linear here, right? So, so if, if z is uh, negative one, the negative of that is gonna be one, right? And, and we subtract one from there. So that's, or, um, or we add one from there. So that's why it's two and negative one, right? Um, and that, that comes down to be zero right at the end here. Um, so maybe I'll just real quickly because I'd set up I'd set up so I could um, um, draw on some um, uh, uh, using the doc camera here. But maybe I'll real quick again. He kind of goes into this in his video here that I'm referring to. But but let me just kind of show you real quickly why this. Um, um, you know, when you use this as your uh, uh, your activation function for the cost function for support vector machine, um, it will give a lower cost to things that have better margins, right? So, so that's kind of the takeaway. That it'll give it'll give things lower cost than this will, right? So this won't be sensitive to this large margin is, um, um, intuition here, right? So. Um, for example, um, oops, um, in his video, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much recreating the example that he had in the video. So let's say you have some points like um, uh, for two classes, um, Something like that. Okay. So for the um, for the normal logistic regression um, minimization function, um, and I'm gonna, I probably should have got some more colors here or something. Um, I mean, basically, these these two sets that I drew, these two classes, are linearly separable pretty easily. But and, and there's all kinds of lines you could draw to, to separate these. You know, so I have one like this, 
or one like this. And you know, effectively, or, or you know, one like this, right? So effectively, you know, and and probably, I mean, just eyeballing the the the, the best large margin one is something like there, if you're following me, the, 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 the stronger one that I did here. But effectively for the, uh, the, the, the regular form of the cost function, uh, all of these lines will effectively get, uh, you know, a, a low, uh, uh, the same kind of cost because they all um, um, get the answer completely correct, get all of the uh, O classes on one side of the line and all the X classes on the other, right? But the cost using that hinge function um, um, differs, right? So if the decision boundary is, is like this, uh, the, the distance, um, so, so really, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details, um, so it depends on um, some linear algebra or something like that, but, but the, the, the distance, the length that each of these points are from the line um, ends up getting into the, the calculation of the cost function, you know, in a way that you don't get um, when you're using the the, the non-hinge version, right? Just, just the, the log of the sigmoid. All right. So you know, so basically, you know, like like this decision boundary here that I'm kind of um, pointing at uh, is going to have a higher cost because it's closer um, to um, the points, even though it linearly separates the two classes um, than the one that I kind of am eyeballing as the one that has the best cost using this hinge function, cost function, all right? So, you know, um, If nothing else, you should um, just understand that um, uh, you know this, this modification uh, and using a slightly different um, activation function um, for our overall cost um, or fitness is what causes. The um, um, this different form to emphasize, um, you know, to, to, to give um, um, preference to decision boundaries that, that try and maximize that margin between there. And, and this still works even if the classes aren't linearly separable, right? So, so it still works intuitively like, like you would expect, um, even though, of course, there's no, you can't have a, if they're not linearly separable, um, um, The, the, um, uh, you wouldn't be able to, to find any boundary th that, that had a margin, but still you would get a similar kind of um, um, value for the cost function that would emphasize things that, you know, um, um, do um, um, separate the best in terms of the, the same idea of, of this uh, uh, margin between classes. Okay. But I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that's that's kind of what's going on here. Um, and again, you know, this, this is this is similar to what are known as rectified linear units. In fact, it, the, they both have the same form. Uh, but uh, but yeah, if you read the literature, this is called a hinge function. Yeah, you know, and, and it's also important for the hinge function for the support vector machine that you know for the for y is one that, it, that, that that yeah that they don't don't come down to the same point, right? So that's kind of what defines the the margin. Um, uh, in the cost function, right? So, so for the, the, the one class, um, it needs to come over here to one before it hinges so that the cost is zero. And for the y equals zero um, part of the function, it needs to be the negative one before it hinges to zero and, and be the, a linear function um, on the other side of that, okay? Um, All right. Anyway, it's, it's in his third video where he goes into, if, if you know some linear algebra, this is very useful to, to, to completely understand um, how this hinge function kind of differs uh, from the, the standard log of the sigmoid um, and um, how it's calculated and, and why it does what it does. All right. 
Um, okay, so with, with that in mind, so that was a little bit of, of some of the stuff that we, I went over last week on support vector machines. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about then kernels because there was uh, kind of a question on assignment four, um, a part of assignment four. Um, yeah. Um, you do have to write a function that implements this Gaussian kernel as is described here, right? So, so uh, again, you know, to do this successfully or to understand what you're doing here, um, probably the best thing to do, you know, if you don't get everything you need from, from this uh, class session um, is to watch Dr. Ng's video on, um, on kernels um, in uh, machine learning here, right? So, um, So to summarize this here, um, I think I may have mentioned before that using kernels, the, the, what's known as the kernel trick with support vector machines um, is, is a similar idea to what we've done a lot of in like the past two assignments. Oh, and also on your test, which was, um, taking the original features and creating polynomial combinations of those features, right? In order to uh, uh, use like, like a, a linear regression, but then to be able to, to fit a nonlinear um, model uh, because we're using uh, a nonlinear, you know, a, 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 a versions of the features. So po polynomial, higher order powers of the, of the features, okay? So the, the kernel trick, you know, if you don't understand anything else about it, if you just understand that, we're, we're doing uh, the, kind of the same thing. So, so for the kernel trick, we're creating new features from the original feature, right? Like we did when we did polynomial combinations uh, quite a bit of, right? We're just doing it in a different way. And we can describe it here. He does, he does a pretty good um, explanation of, of what we do with um, uh, kernels um, in order to create these from the original features of the input data that we use in order to do the kernel trick with support vector machines. Um, 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 in short, to, to skip ahead a little bit here, Kernels are not often used with other things besides support vector machines or not as much. Um, and there's reasons why it mostly comes down to performance reasons. So, so um, because of the internals of support vector machines, uh, it makes it that you can create a cost function that works very well without additional um, computational costs uh, using uh, kernel features instead of just the the the, the regular you know features. So, so transforming them using these uh, these kernels here. Right? Um, so there's performance reasons why kernels uh, are mostly kind of a thing that first came with support vector machines and, and continue to mostly be uh, kind of in the realm of support vector machines. So. The other thing, I mean, that makes you know the kernel trick possible is that unlike polynomial features, which we talked a little bit about, um, um, they, they kind of scale uh, exponentially. I mean, so if you take all the possible combinations of the squares and the cubes and things like that, uh, you'll very quickly explode the number of polynomial features that you would create from the original features, right, to train a model with. So um, kernel uh, features that we create, normally what we do, as he talks about in his video here, um, is we create uh, one kernel feature to correspond with every one of the training data that we have um, as input when we're training a model, right? So in that case, the, 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 um, the, the kernels, so adding in kernel features just scales with the size of your training set data, uh, you know, which can be much less, much more computationally um, tractable than and then some sort of an exponential scaling if you're trying to get all of the different combinations of, of polynomials, right? So that's that's another reason why kind of kernels work, where polynomials is, is a bit of a trick. Um, so, so normally, if you need to have a nonlinear model, 
um, you'll probably use something else besides, you know, like linear regression or logistic regression and trying to fit it with handmade polynomial features or something like that. Um, All right, so uh, let me just describe a few of the details here that would help you with assignment four then. So um, I did ask you to kind of recreate the um, 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 Gaussian uh, kernel function here. Um, although you have to create the, the Gaussian kernel function that um, um, you might have, I mean, if, if you kind of carefully look at the um, um, this lecture notebook here, you might have most everything that you need really for the assignment. Now that I think about it, um, so so kind of how these work. Um, so so you can think of like like a a kernel as as a similarity based measure, right? So for a Gaussian kernel function, it uses this function, okay? And and you know it, it, you may or may not be familiar with this. So it's a little bit. Um, Pixelated there. Probably should have used a little bit more. Um, more point. We plotted that. Here we go. Um, so this is really the same thing. If you know what a Gaussian um, distribution is, like from statistics, um, this is the same thing. So this is the, the bell curve or the Gaussian um, um, distribution here, right? So, you know, in this case, it, it has a, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, right? If we use, um, um, yeah, I mean, right. So mu and sigma, I mean, this is exactly the same thing you would use if you're if you were defining or using um, a Gaussian distribution, right? So you give it mu and sigma. So that defines the mean um, and the, the standard deviation of, of your Gaussian or your bell curve here, right? So if you use a mu of zero and a standard deviation of one, you get something that looks like this, where you get a value about a value of one. At the, at, at the mean, and you know, it, it, it um, rapidly uh, gets smaller as you get away from from mu or, or, or the, the mean value. So basically, at one plus and minus one standard deviation, sixty six percent of the area under this distribution is between negative one and one standard deviation. So that's what the the sigma gives you the, the second parameter. So those are the two parameters that you pass in here. Th those affect the kind of the width. And, and the location of the uh, the mean here, right? So you know, just real quickly, like like if you use, so it might be tough to see this unless I make multiple plots here. Um, yeah, I can maybe make a real quick second plot. So if you do a mu, if you do a, a the the um, mu at uh, 1.5 with the standard deviation of two. I'm gonna make that blue. Uh, I gotta change my figure axes here. So go from even more. So maybe it's not completely obvious, but it's why, I mean, you know, the, the, the center of course is at 1.5, so you can see it's shifted, but it, it's, it's actually a lot wider here. So let's go from, um, just to make it completely obvious, we'll make a standard deviation of uh, four. And it spreads out quite a bit more, here, right? All right. Anyway, so so this this is related to you know uh, Gaussian distributions here. Um, this is where this comes from. So, so how does this work for um, these kernels? Um, so the basic idea is uh, think of having defining one of these. Okay. So when um, um, maybe again I might have to draw some some stuff here, but. Um,
what you basically do, um, so if you have a single feature, let me, let me go back. If you have a single feature, um, so we'll do it just one dimensional here. But if you have the, the center of the, the kernel be at um, um, two with, we'll make the, 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 the sigma be 0.5 here, right? So what that does, um, so you can think of this as the measure of similarity, right? So, so, um, so for a, another point that I want to determine um, how similar it is to this kernel that I've got drawn here, um, you, you would just use uh, where it is on this function, right? So basically, uh, if, if, if I have another point, if I wanna know how, whether it's the same as, the, or how similar it is to this kernel, you know, so, so the, if my X1 was uh, two, uh, it would have a similarity from this Gaussian kernel 1.0, right? And if my X1 was five, Right, so if my feature one was a five, it would be you know essentially zero. Right, this, this isn't exactly zero; it goes to zero um, as x goes to plus and minus infinity. But you know it's essentially zero once you get out here. Right. So I mean you know this is directly, and, and of course you can extend this to two, three, or multiple dimensions. Right. So in that case, and that's what this figure down here in the notebook is doing. So here we extend that to two dimensions. Um, in this case, right, we're doing this in a vectorized way here. So uh, in this case, the, the center for feature one is three and the center for feature two is five, right? So, so the, the center for feature one is at the three and the center for feature two is five. Right? And this is, this is a, um, a contour plot here, right? Uh, but yeah, in this case though, you only, you don't, uh, sigma is not gonna be, um, um, actually I'm not certain. I mean, um, I, I think normally you just use the same sigma for all dimensions, right? So we pass in sigma as a scalar here. So we use a sigma of one, right? But again, that, that that's gonna affect how much it spreads out. But in this case, since, since we're two dimensional, uh, that affects the, the spread out in, in all directions from the, the, the center, the, the three, five point here, right? So, you know, it, it might better, I probably should have turned on my, my 3D rotation here, but, but it might be better to, to visualize this in, in three dimensions, like from this three dimensional plot, you know, so again, for uh, X1 is three and X2 is five, um, you know, you get something like that, right? But again, this is gonna be the measure of similarity. So if I have a point over here at uh, X1 of six and an X2 of four, you know, it's gonna have a similarity somewhere like that, right? And if I'm at four, four, I'm gonna be somewhere in here. So, so that's gonna be more similar, right? So the closer you get to the center, the, the, the more sim similar your feature is gonna to be to that kernel, right? By this measurement here. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, you can try, like I said, mentioned there, you could try um, um, changing um, the center I and mean, that'll, that'll just change where it plots at. Uh, you can see what the effect is. Like, again, if we use like a bigger sigma, it should spread it out. So, so now so I'm still using the same limits for my x and y axis. So you can see it kind of went uh, uh, way out there. Um, and then if we do the 3D plot, so you can see it, it's bulging. So, yeah. Or we can narrow that, you know, until instead of one, to make it more like a pin prick if we go to 0 0.1 or something like that. So it'll be very steep um, and um, um, not have very much of a, a, base, a base, right? So here, only things that are really close to the 3.5, relatively speaking in, in the space that we're seeing here, have any similarity and, and most, everything else that's even not too far away, right? So you talked about in the video, so the one way to affect the regularization of, of a support vector machine where you're using kernels is by changing the sigma, right? So, so um, um, 
when you use a small sigma like this, you're going to be uh, prone to overfitting. Um, and when you use a large one, uh, you'll be prone to generalizing where, of course, if it's too large, you might be you know, overgeneralizing and not getting as much power from the model as, as you can. Um, The, oh, it looks like there's an error in the notebook here. I have to check that. Um, Um, give me a second here. Let's see. How can that be a string? I can find your quote. Might be reading in quite correctly here for some reason. Didn't know that before today here. Yeah, those are coming in with strings for some reason. Ah, I'll, I'll see if I can fix that. So, um, anyway, let's, let's move on. So, so yeah, I don't know why. It must be a problem with the data file in there. Um, but it's coming in as a string. Oh, uh, probably the first the first column must be, um, yeah. So so hmm. We should have um, um, told it that the, the the first row was the the header information because um, it looks like it's taking the first row as values. So those six those are strings there. So. Um, so, I guess we need to say, I actually thought it um, inferred this correctly. Um, Um, okay, yeah, let me come back to that. Um, we'll come back to there. Um, there wasn't anything else down here that I don't think I was going to talk about. There were some more examples of using um, support vector machine, which would be useful for the assignment four. Um, um, so anyway, for like the, the part three for assignment four, um, we need to, you, you need to create a function called Gaussian kernel that takes, um, Um, two values. So one is going to be the, the center of the kernel and the other is going to be the, the, the value that you want to measure the similarity to it. So use a modification of the, the, the function that we were doing before um, and you pass in sigma as the third parameter here. So. So yeah, I mean, you think of these as one of these is the input um, and one of these is the, um, the the landmark for a kernel, right? So, so yeah, if, if you have two of these, think of these as points in four-dimensional space in this case. 
And then if, if so, so yeah, if they're exactly at the same location, you should always get one for, for two points that are, um, uh, where the input point and the landmark uh, kernel location are the same, you should get one, right? Um, and you know you should you can see what you should be getting. It is possible to do this function completely vectorized. You don't have to have a loop in here. So I encourage you to try to do that. Oh, and, and if you don't know, uh, he discusses it in the video. So so this is notation for the uh, the, the the norm. So this really gets the length. Uh, of, so so you take the, the the difference of these two vectors um, um, and um, uh, find the length of that resulting uh, vector. So, Uh, but yeah, you can use like the, the the linear algebra norm function to do that, for example, um, from um, from NumPy so, and other ways. So. Once you have that function, I, I don't think I mean basically um, uh, you end up using it. Uh, but I kind of gave you the way to use it, uh, so you can pass in by hand. Um, a function that defines a kernel, right? So, so uh, the the scikit learn um, has some standard kernels. Um, so, so, um, so actually, um, it uses uh, what are known as radial basis functions. But uh, a Gaussian kernel is really a special case of a radial basis function, um, and I discuss it kind of in our assignment here. So, for particular values of the radial basis function, you get like a Gaussian kernel. And then that's kind of what the, the part four of the assignment is demonstrating. So if you implement the Gaussian, your Gaussian kernel correctly, you should get exactly the same result as you would get if you do a radial basis function with the settings um, that we specify um, here. So. All right. Um, okay, so that would be a good place for a break. Uh, anybody wanted to ask any kind of question um, about the assignment four here or anything before I move on? And before I take a quick break here. Okay, I'm going to take about uh, five minutes here, uh, maybe a little longer, so about 5.30, 5.28, 29, or something like that. Um, maybe see if I can get that thing fixed on this notebook and um, put it on there. Uh, when we come back, I was planning on talking a little bit about uh, our materials for this week, so about um, uh, decision trees and some ensembles a bit. So, all right. All right, um, let's continue on. Um, okay, so I did find the error and I just pushed it there, but uh, for anybody watching this, it might be quicker. If, um, if you wanna see those examples, maybe I'll talk about those examples real quickly, but uh, but yeah, the, the, the file name had changed, so it wasn't quite the right data that we wanted to read in. So you need to change it to actually the assignment two exam data is, is the one that we're trying to use for the example there. So if you just get the file name correct, these examples should work, but yeah, these were just all examples of using um, scikit-learn um, support vector machine to um, um, uh, create a classifier for that uh, exam data that we'd use for a previous assignment, right? So yeah, I mean, if you use like a linear, or well, this is first using a logistic regression, but um, If you use a, um, um, uh, a linear support vector machines, you can usually use uh, SVC, which was support vector classifier, like we've talked about, and say that you want uh, a linear uh, model. Um, 
And then you'll basically get not, not maybe not exactly the same decision boundary, but pretty much the same one as you would get with a logistic regression classifier here, um, uh, just doing a linear decision boundary. So, um, or yeah, I'm changing the data set a little bit, but um, um, I mean, you can use a support vector machine with uh, a different kernel than a linear kernel. Okay, so if you use a linear kernel, you're going to get a linear model. If you use um, a kernel function that's nonlinear, like radial basis function, like we talked about, so those basically allow you to get nonlinear decision boundaries, right? So the default um, is probably to use. Um, A, um, yeah, is to use a nonlinear radial basis function for SBC, right? I, I think if I, I remember right, so we showed before, uh, if you really do want a linear uh, support vector machine, um, you could probably, you'd probably want to just use the linear SVM class. So there's like a linear SVM class, right? But, uh, but yeah, so normally when you use um, the, the more standard support vector classifier, uh, you're going to want a nonlinear kernels uh, in there, uh, which is what you get by default. So by default, it uses radial basis functions, but we've got um, what? Um, you could use polynomial kernels, so you'll get something more similar to doing polynomial feature um, um, combinations like we've done. Um, sigmoid So, oh, and in our um, assignment, um, uh, we actually pass in a callable. So we pass in our own function, if you look at that. So again, you know, just to, to show you what's um, being done here, um, or I guess we didn't have an example of this, but um, what you need to do could be described here. So basically, if you specify this function for the kernel parameter, it should take that. So this is the form that's expecting. This wraps around the Gaussian kernel that you're supposed to create in version 1.3. So yeah, if you specify that as your function, it'll be using your hand-built Gaussian kernel um, here, right? So that's, that's what's going on on the assignment four here. Um, all right, so let's move on. I think there was some questions about the assignment four here. It's like, let me get my water. Um, Okay, so uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about this decision trees and ensembles as well. So um, I don't know if, uh, if we'll have some of these in our next assignment or not um, somewhere, but um, uh, decision trees, well, actually in ensembles are, in some cases, uh, they work uh, better than um, like a deep learning model. Um, so, so they're very powerful. So they're often the go-to, they're often the things that end up being winners, uh, for example, like at Kegel competitions for machine learning or other things, right? Um, although you can have uh, ensembles of, of different kinds of classifiers. Um, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit here. So a basic ensemble like a random forest um, is just an ensemble of a bunch of decision trees, right? So my, my understanding, I haven't done a lot of like machine learning cable Kegel competitions or things, but a lot of times the, the winners tend to be ensembles of uh, multiple uh, different um, uh, machine learning um, 
approach is, right? So you eke out sort of your, your uh, final uh, few percentage points of performance by ensembling together a bunch of different types of good classifiers. Right? Anyway, um, I'm probably mostly gonna talk about decision trees um, um, and uh, kind of leave it for you guys to go through the ensemble stuff on your own. Um, Decision trees. Oh, and and you know, I, I had a, a video about this in our um, materials on MyLeo Online. Although it was a it was a previous class session, so I'm kind of going through uh, the same stuff here. But uh, you can watch that as well. Um, um, in some ways, decision trees would would actually make a good um, machine learning model to start with. That they, they are probably easier to understand than most anything else, except for maybe uh, K nearest neighbors that we've already talked about, right? Um, probably even easier to understand than K nearest neighbors, um, as you'll see here, if you haven't looked through the materials or read the textbook yet. Um, um, the, for this lecture notebook, uh, we mostly use, go back and use the iris data set, which you probably, you know, you've, you've seen quite a few examples of using this um, already, so you're quite familiar with it, right? So here, you know, we're doing a classification task. Um, in this case, it's a multi-class classification, so we've got three categories in this data set. Uh, one of the categories is pretty linearly separable from the other two, so it's pretty easy to find a decision boundary that, that correctly classify Satosa from anything else, but the other two um, have some overlap. So you can see from all the, there, there's four possible features on here. So we're plotting out all possible combinations of, of each of the four features with the others. So uh, on none of these combinations are they, they completely linearly separable. There's some that get close. So, but um, possibly on a combination of like these two features with, with, with two different ones, you could get a pretty nice clean separation um, on these, although maybe not perfect. So. Um, so um, let's talk about what a decision tree does, uh, first of all. So I think in this example, um, although there's four features, we just use two again. So we reduced it down to two. Um, although we're, we kept it as a multi-class, so, so we've got three classes that we're trying to output here um, in our classifier. Um, So jump to it. Um, I mean, um, you can kind of create a decision tree, uh, and then I kind of showed a way you can actually uh, create a figure from the trained decision tree, right? So, uh, decision trees. I, I later on talk about uh, these are often considered white box machine learning models, right? Because they are. Um, relatively easy to look inside of it and understand how they're making their decisions, right? Compared to many other things, um, which people call black boxes. So when it's kind of tough to understand how the model is making its decision, um, it's kind of a black box. Uh, but here, a decision tree is really just kind of um, um, uh, if the if else statements, right? So you all know how to do an if else statement. So the way that this trained decision tree is making its decision is it, it, it looks um, at the pedal length and if the pedal length is less than 2.45, we go to the left and it's always using a binary tree. So it's, it's, it's if this is true, then we go over here and maybe do another test. Um, else we go over here, maybe do another test. Or uh, yeah, if we get to a leaf node, then that's when, where we make the decision. So in this case, if it's less than 2.45, we go left here. So if, it's, if that's true, if our check condition is true, um, we go left. And that since that's a leaf node, that makes a decision. So we're going to uh, predict that the class is Satosa in this case, right? So you know, if you go back up here and look at, um, so here's the pedal length, right? So you can see just looking at that feature, so like a 2.45 is a decision boundary, like 
right here, right? So, and, and, and you know, that probably does uh, separate those. I mean, and that's, that's what the other information um, in the node is saying here. So by separating, um, um, so at this node we had, there was actually 150 uh, inputs, uh, equal numbers in each of the three classes the Satosa, Versicolor, and Virginica, right? So when we make this decision boundary, we end up with 50 um, have pedal lengths less than 2.45 and 100 have pedal lengths greater than 2.45. And it happens that all 50 that have less than that um, are in the same class, which you can kind of infer um, from this node here, right? So it, it, it uh, completely separated correctly the Satosa from everything else with that decision boundary. Right. Um, if the pedal length is greater than 2.45, you know, we're over to the right over here, right? So we've got a combination of these two things, right? Um, so here again, uh, oh, it uses pedal width in, in my, if you rerun this, um, um, you can try regenerating this. I, I, I can't remember if I, um, um, I mean, this should work. So let me restart the notebook here. And so this just, you know, trains a decision tree classifier using the normal. Um, uh, scikit-learn framework that you've kind of learned about this, you know, one of the important um, meta features is the math, is the depth of the tree, right? So I'll probably talk about it here uh, in a bit, but um, if you let the tree be unconstrained, you're going to get a perfect classifier all, every time for a decision tree. It'll always be perfect unclassifying the data that you train it with. But, you know, it, 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 it's probably overfitted, so it, it may not do well on on uh, unseen data if you, if you do an unconstrained tree. So normally you want to limit the depth um, somewhere along to some height. So that, that's the maximum height or depth of the tree, right? So for max depth of true two, we're only going to have a below the root node two more levels um, at most. Um, so this cell just creates this file called irisTree dot, which can then be run through another program to create a PNG file, which is what we're displaying here. So, so this, this, you know, if you're like on Windows, you know, you wouldn't be able to easily get this, but, uh, but I, don't, I don't remember if I installed this, so we could probably easily install this on your dev box. So if you run this cell, um, yeah, it, it, uh, it ran. So it regenerated um, that PNG file. So that means that, that at least on my dev box, I had it installed. So it probably should be on yours if you're using the dev box. So this will regenerate the PNG file, right? So whatever the, the decisions that were actually made, and, and like I, I think I mentioned before, I mean, these can vary a little bit. There is some randomness and variability in here. Um, but yeah, this is just loading that the figure that we just generated uh, uh, there. Um, all right, so back to our decision tree that we just created. Um, at this level, we've still got uh, uh, 50 values that hadn't been, um, or sorry, 100 values that hadn't been uh, classified yet. If we followed the right branch, so the, the false branch, so all these remaining have pedal widths uh, greater than 2.45, right? So now, sorry, pedal lengths greater than 2.45, right? So now it makes a, a decision based on pedal width less than 1.75. So we can go back up here and, and look again. So, so again, I can use um, uh, this plot here, pedal length versus pedal width, right? So we're doing it at basically, what, what did I say? It's got 1.75 basically about right here, which you know, you, can, you can see visually makes sense, right? So if, if things uh, that are remaining are less than 1.75, um, then it's true. We're gonna go over here and that should be the uh, orange ones, which is the Versicolor. 
right? But again, remember, you know, we've already made this first decision. So these are gonna be things that have pedal length greater than the first decision, whatever, 2.45, but less, but pedal widths that are less than 1.75, right? So you can think of two decision boundaries now that we've got carving up this figure here, right? And those, um, so here we don't get a perfect separation. And again, sorry to keep going back and forth, but as you can kind of see, um, we're not gonna quite get a perfect separation on here. There's no linear, um, separability completely between these two. Um, but, you know, for that boundary going left here, um, we end up with um, um, 54 samples have pedal widths less than 1.75, right? And of those, 49 were basically versicolor. Um, and, and of course, we, had, we, we didn't have any um, setosa and we still don't have any, but, but um, five, um, of the ones with pedal widths less than that are, are um, actually virginica. They are going to get misclassified if we ask for predictions for those five points from this classifier here, right? And, you know, to finish off, um, if the pedal width is greater than 1.5, we go to the right, and that's another leaf node for the tree. So in that case, we make a decision um, we have the remaining 46 samples of the 100 that we were splitting here. Um, um, end up uh, over here with pedal width greater than 1.75, right? And of those, 45 of them are actually for Genica, um, which are going to get classified correctly um, from our training data for the small decision tree. And, and one was actually a versicolor. Which, which would be incorrectly classified here, right? Um, okay, and before I, I move on, so the, the only thing that you need to understand about how um, you know, a decision tree model can be created is how do you select which feature you're gonna to use to make a decision on and how do you select the, the value um, that you're gonna to use to divide that feature, right? So for a decision tree, um, you always just use one feature for every decision, right? So that means that you're always gonna have to be splitting up your space uh, into lines on, on one particular feature, right? So left of, of 2.45 or right 2.45 for a first decision one, right? Um, and, um, our textbook and later on in the selection notebook, we talk a little bit about how that can be um, automated, right? So, so how you can use a cost function to decide uh, what the best feature is and what the best value is to split on to uh, maximize your predictive you know, performance, minimize your cost. So. Um, all right, before we get to that, talking about the um, um, talking about the CART training algorithm and the, the fitness function for the decision tree, um, just kind of a note about making predictions. So, so making predictions here is pretty simple. So if I have a new value that you know we didn't train with, I, I just uh, have to go through the decision tree till we get to a leaf node, and that will tell us what we're going to what prediction we're going to make okay another thing that's that's discussed in here is that um, um, the distribution of the correct and incorrect values at the leaf node gives you an estimate of how confident you are right so we're 100 percent confident we're gonna have a pretty high confidence that uh, if we end up over at this leaf node that our prediction for sedosa is correct right here we're going to have a um uh, a 49 out of 54, you know, again, pretty high, um, but, but that would be our confidence that um, um, we're correct here uh, if we end up at this leaf node in predicting versatility, right? So, I mean, there is a little bit uncertainty, right? Because we know from our training data that, that this isn't perfect um, here. So this gives us a bit of an estimate of to expect for unseen data, um, how we would do if we end up at this, uh, leaf node, right? Um, uh, 
So, um, so another thing that I just mentioned is performance about making predictions here. So this classifier, um, once you've built it, so, so once you've trained a decision tree classifier, to classify new data points is going to be very fast to, to, to get to a leaf node. Okay, so it's going to be you know the 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 law is going to be the, the height of the tree. So whatever the the highest node highest uh, level is, whatever your depth of your tree is, that's how many um, tests or decisions you're going to have to make before you get to a leaf node or before. Right, so you might get to a leaf node sooner than that, but at the maximum is you'd have to go to uh, down to the, whatever the, the depth is of the tree, right? Um, and that's usually going to be uh, quite small compared to you know the, the number of features or the number of um, um, inputs you use for training data. Um, but you know, make that that that's not all that special compared to other. Uh, machine learning classifiers that we've looked at, you know, so this, the same thing could be said for, for example, logistic regression or support vector machines. So once you train the model, um, both of those are also going to be, uh, 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 well, at least linear in the number of parameters. So this is going to be linear in the depth of the tree to make a new decision frame. But those, those are all kind of quick. The only, one, only model that we've looked at um, that is kind of a bit different in performance on that is the Cadenier's neighbors. Remember, we, we talked a little bit about that, right? So Cadenier's neighbors, really, there's no training for the model, but to make a prediction, you have to calculate the similarity between a new point and every existing point, right? So a Cadenier's neighbor scales with the size of the input training data, um, uh, you know, that, that you're using for your model, right? So if, if you have large amounts of data, um, it, it can be relatively quite a bit slower to make a prediction with Cadenier's neighbors than it would be with like a trained decision tree um, where the depth is usually, you know, not gonna be more than a hundred or so um, or, you know, a logistic regression, which is gonna be depending on the number of parameters that you have in the model, um, which is only gonna be hundreds or thousands at most. Um, so. um, So unlike support vector machines, which I probably should have emphasized when I was talking about them again, um, I talked about these before, but support vector machines um, and, and uh, like um, logistic regressions and linear regressions are kind of sensitive to scaling. So you really need to scale your features um, and, and also Cadenier's neighbors. Uh, but uh, uh, so one thing about um, decision trees is that they're not really that sensitive. They're not sensitive to, to feature, to having all the features be of approximately the same scale, right? So you don't really have to worry about scaling if, if you're using a decision tree. So. Um. Okay, so finally, let, let's let's look at that uh, that Jenny, oops, that Jenny um, attribute that. Um, um, we saw measured in here, so I kind of skipped over that. So the only thing that I think that we didn't discuss about the figure of the decision tree that resulted. Okay, so uh, the 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 Ginny um, uh, the 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 Ginny impurity. Um, the way I think of it is, it's really just a measure of. Um, How well the data is split at that point. Okay, so this measure can, can be a number from zero to one, right? So you can get as low as zero or, 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 or a big number, right? Maybe, maybe it can be bigger than one. Um, I have to look at the function here again. Um, so, I mean, first of all, let's just kind of look at how you calculate it mechanically. So, so I think here, if you want to, so, so there's the equation for calculating the Gini impurity. It's one minus the sum of the, the square of these P's, where, where this P is just the ratio of the number of values in the class divided by the total. And you do that over all of your N 
so, so here, if, if we've got three outputs, n is three, right? So that's the number of classes in our classification problem here. Okay. So um, if you do this for the one that was 0, 4, and 5, that's, that's this node here. If you plug those in, you know, so you get 0, 45 squared, which is 0, and then 49 over 55, 4 squared, and 5 over 54 squared. Um, Take those, um, it's one minus, actually, you can just sum these up and then take one minus the sum of those, or equivalently, one minus that, minus that, minus that. Um, so yeah, that, that comes up with a value of 0.168, and that's what's being reported here, right? So what's that measure? Um, so an impurity of zero means that, um, um, so, so if you calculate that, you know, so this would have been, um, so the number of samples is 50. So you would have had 50 over 50, which is one, which squared is one. And then the other two would have been zero, right? So that's why it ends up being zero, right? Um, and, um, And, and so this number is going to be in relation to um, how pure, so, so the impurity is meant to mean how, how pure it is that we have divided up, right? So, so it's, it's mostly kind of a function of, you know, the, so, so here we're, we're calculating Virginica, which, um, or, or we're predicting Virginica, and we had 45, and we only had one of, of something else that was non-Virginica, right? So that's going to end up with a really low number. Right. And here is a little bit higher because we had 49 out of 54. We had five that weren't um, versicolor. Yeah. All right. So, um, so really, I mean, it doesn't doesn't actually depend on. Um, you know, so you don't have to do anything special for what the correct class is versus the others, right? But. Um, 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 it's really just a measure of how mixed these are, right? Um, um, so so, so I, I talk a little bit about that because basically what you want to do, so part of the decision function, the, the, the cost function that, that we use for decision trees um, is we're going to be calculating the, the Gini impurity. And we want to have a decision boundary. So we, we, we want to select a... Um, um, a feature and then a decision boundary that gives a Gini as close to 0.5 as possible. So that exactly divides the space in half, right? Um, um, or that, that maybe not quite the correct way to think about it. So, so anyway, we want one though. So we want to calculate that. We, we're going to use that basically in, in making our decision about the, the feature um, and the, um, the value for that feature to, to be doing, um, to, to make a decision um, for a node here, okay? Um, Um, oh yeah, and then you know, in this notebook, I share some examples then of the um, visualizing those decision boundaries. So, so for this particular decision tree, um, you know, I kind of already did it up above there by hand, but you know, so we have our first decision made at 2.45 on the pedal length, um, and then a second decision made at um, uh, 1.75 um, on the pedal width, right? Like dividing up the space like that here. Um, if you let the tree go a little bit longer, like a next depth of three, um, you know, we'll see, so it's going to start getting more complicated. Again, we've only got two features. We only extracted two features, so we can only use either pedal length or pedal width um, um, in this example here. But yeah, if you pull these all out, um, you'll see something like this, right? Um, 
sometimes you won't see a decision boundary because um, um, it'll end up uh, um, making the same decision um, that you have gotten originally. But, but we should be able to find all these in there. So for example, for a pedal length of less than 4.85, um, that's this one here. And if it's, if it's less than, uh, we we're gonna go over here to Virginica, right? So um, again, but, but yeah, that one is doing, um, just a very small kind of thing here, right? Um, because, oh yeah, so the one that we probably see, the, the, the big one that we can mainly see on this diagram down here is if it's less than 4.995, uh, we go left, and that's that's first of colors. That that's the main one that's done here. Um, but um, this this one over here only happens for pedal width greater than one point seven five, right? So so that's only happening above here. Uh, but um, um, uh, but a decision boundary of like four point eight five. So that, that that's being used in a decision here, which I guess maybe the um, um, this contour plot uh, can quite see the, the things going on there. But, um, but yeah, they, they should all end up kind of showing up on the figure here. So if you're plotting them out. All right, let's move on. Um, so I already talked about kind of white block box versus black box. Um, and I really already talked about this. Um, so, you know, um, the, the, you can also, so not all models in machine learning um, can make a probability, so it give some sort of a confidence of, of, of how the prediction would work or not, right? So it depends um, on kind of the details of the model. So, but um, decision trees are in that class that they can, so you can ask for, um, Probabilities. We've already seen that you know you can get probabilities on the uh, logistic regression um, of the, how confident the model is going to be. So uh, that'll have that'll be a function again of how far or close it is to the a decision boundary, that type of thing. But here, you know, um, I already said it, it's kind of a function when you get down to the leaf node. Um, it's going to depend on kind of how well split up that classes. So it'll be kind of pretty confident here. It's versus color, not so much here. There's only three things down here and, and only two of the three. So it's so only 0.66 and it's Virginica. Um, All right, so let's talk a little bit about the details then of um, how the fitness function actually works for a um, uh, decision tree. Um, decision tree uses this uh, CART algorithm, classification and regression tree, um, I guess. So by deciding on a particular feature K and then the decision boundary TK, right? We can uh, calculate the cost of that using the, 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 the Jenny. So, so this is using that Jenny impurity, okay? Um, times the, um, um, so this is really doing just a weighted average, right? So, um, the number um, of items over the total that are going to go to the left times the Jenny impurity on the left side, plus the number of items total divided number of items that go into the right divided by the total. So, so really, this is like a weighted average, right? So, if you have five out of hundred going to the left, you're going to take five out of one hundred times the Jenny impurity on the left side plus the 95 out of 100 went to the right, okay? So, you know, again, you could pretty easily implement that. Um, um, if we go back and look at like the simple tree here, so we're really using 
um, I believe the, 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 the Gini here and the, um, the, the ratio, right? So this would be 50 out of 150 times zero, right? Um, plus the 100 out of 150 times this Gini, Gini period, 0.5, right? So that was the total cost of what we ended up deciding was the, the uh, best decision boundary that to minimize the cost among the ones that were tried out here, right? Um, And uh, yeah, again, so these, you know, this defines a cost function. Um, and um, I believe that this is, I mean, you know, like, like a cost function, it is differentiable. So, so you can actually take the derivative of that. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, um, use something like gradient descent then to find um, uh, the, the, the value in that space that uh, minimizes uh, your cost function given um, your current state of the tree. Okay? Um, but it actually does this, this uh, cost finding a K and TK multiple times. It does that for each node, okay, in, in what's known as a greedy um, um, algorithm. So, so it, it, it greedily searches for the optimum split it can find given the current Side of the tree, you know. So, so um, again, if I can go back to the first one, the most simple one. Uh, after we came down to here, there's actually only a hundred left. Okay, so there's only a um, hundred um, samples left um, that we're um, uh, trying to make a new decision boundary on, uh, of which we um, calculate the um, cost function for different values of whether we use pedal width or pedal length. Um, and the, the location, so the, the, the TK, uh, so, so the K, so which feature and TK, like which value you use for that decision boundary, right? So over that, basically, you know, we're saying that, that the optimum at that point of the tree was the feature pedal width at, the, at, at TK 1.75. So that gave the lowest cost. So that was chosen um, and we end up with this um, state of affairs. And we would keep doing that if, if the tree has more depth than two here, right? So have our cost function over this one to split it, and our cost function over this one to split it. Okay. Um, although you do stop this, like, like for example, when you get here, um, um, you can never do any better than that. So if you, if you get a Jenny of zero, um, then that's going to be you know a stopping point, a leaf, right? So you either stop when you get a Jenny down to zero or when you hit like max depth or some other um, criteria to stop getting your tree um, um, uh, filled out. Um, all right, so anyway, you know, um, I mean that definition of the fitness, fitness function or the cost function, once you have it, then, you know, you can use the optimizer um, optimization techniques like we've been talking about, you know, like, like we've seen examples of for our logistic regression and linear regressions and, and, and other contexts. So, um, although it does do it iteratively, so we're doing that for every new decision node that we want to make in the tree. Um, to, to um, our textbook talks about this. Uh, th there's, it, it's, in theory, you could actually end up with a better decision tree sometimes if you make a non-optimal decision on a node above, right? So, so by making um, a slightly non-optimal decision, you could end up in, with a situation where you have a better um, decision boundary that can be made, right? But the, the, the CART algorithm can't do that. So it uses a greedy algorithm. Um, so at at each node, it picks the one that's optimal just for that node, um, and then it continues down, um, picking the optimal, the, the best one it can find 
um, uh, at each new node, right? In theory, you could try to optimize the, the cost function over like all the nodes of the tree, um, but um, that's computationally, um, um, uh, that's an exponential um, uh, algorithm here. So in practice, you can't really do that. Um, Um, all right, and I already mentioned though, then making prediction. Well, once you have a train decision tree, um, you know, it's, it's uh, not computationally expensive to use that to make predictions, like for logistic regressions and things, but unlike for paid nearest neighbor. Um, um, Yeah, so our textbook talks about, I mean, you can use some other measures, uh, but the, the, the effects are about the same. So you can read our textbook about that. So you can use entropy instead of the gen impurity. I don't know if I can't remember if our textbook talks about some others or not. So. Um, so yeah, in many ways, I mean, decision trees are are quite nice to use, right? Um, although like a simple decision tree tends not to be real great uh, in terms of making good models. But when you start making ensembles of decision trees, um, then, then you can really get some, some power out of them, right? And I think I already mentioned, I mean, ensembles like random forests of decision trees uh, can often perform at uh, the, the, the best performance of any sorts of machine learning models. Um, um, yeah, so decision trees are non-parametric, okay? So, um, so for example, when we do like linear regression, we're, we're implicitly assuming that, uh, you know, we're fitting a straight line to the regression data. So that's an, an example of kind of a parametric model, right? Um, Or, you know, if we're doing um, even if we want to do um, some sort of a nonlinearity by, for example, adding polynomial features, we're still um, specifying the kind of the shape of the model, right? So it's an order four or five. Um, uh, polynomial uh, degree features that we use. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, for parametric uh, has a predetermined number of parameters. Um, so like linear regression, um, the, the parameters is fixed um, because we assume the linear relationship um, so yeah, if we have a single feature, then they're going to be exactly two parameters, the slope and intercept. Um, um, so decision trees can be prone to overfitting. Um, so, so you do need to use some of these meta parameters to restrict their freedom. So, so the, and the default for decision tree is to, um, um, is to do like a full tree, I believe. I have to go back and, and, and read the documentation again. But um, so anyway, so when you're when you're limiting these, uh, and basically how, how you regularize. So, so you know, uh, the, the, the fitness function or the cost function for system trees, um, because we don't have like the fixed set of parameters, you can't do like the L1 or L2 normalization here, um, or sorry, regularization here to uh, uh, regularize and try to fit, uh, try to fight uh, overfitting, right? So the way you um, regularize a decision tree is slightly different, you know, so you use constraints on different things. So we already mentioned like the, the max depth. Um, there, there's actually a lot of those. So, um, Uh, 
So, you know, you can keep it. So once node to get down to a certain sample size, you can stop splitting them, even though if their Gini is not down to zero, right? That's another way of, of, of causing, you know, a, a leaf to, you know, to end up deciding this is a leaf node. Um, Um, or in the you know, same, same way, so you can do that um, uh, both for uh, non-leaf nodes, so you can have, make a, a minimum for the, the number of samples that you end up at a leaf node. So all leaf nodes have to have uh, at least some minimal number of samples, or you can do that also within the interior nodes, making you know, the, the decision nodes that do the splits, right? Um, uh, instead of constraining depth, you can say there's some maximum number of actual leaf nodes that should be found, and then you stop once you get to that maximum. Um, um, you can constrain, you know, so you can make it so it only uses uh, a certain maximum number of features that are evaluated. Uh, to split each node. Um, um, all right, and then finally, um, for decision trees anyway, at, at first glance, it might look like decision trees are really um, basically for doing classification problems. Um, so supervised learning uh, classification, but maybe a little bit surprising, at least, at least to me when I kind of first came across these, and you can also use decision trees uh, for regression. Um, so to fit, you know, a real valued uh, output function, right? Um, so for example, so at this, Final example in this lecture notebook, uh, we just use a made up data set, which um, I thought I plotted, but um, uh, so anyway, the, the, the data set here is, is really just quadratic, right? So it's really just a squared function here. Um, but, um, but here, yeah, we're using a decision tree for regression problem. So, so you should use, the decision tree regressor from scikit-learn if you want to do regression using a decision tree. Uh, it's, basically doing, it's basically the same as the decision tree that we just talked about, but it, it sets some of the default parameters uh, to work uh, you know, uh, uh, better with a, a regression problem here, basically. So, um, and here we set the max depth to two again. So in that case, we end up with just a, a, like, uh, like three uh, possible leaf nodes, I believe. So one, two, three for the max depth of two here. Probably should have displayed the uh, resulting tree again here. But so what it's doing? So basically, the um, it divides up. So say we're just using a single feature, right? And again, remember we're trying to predict the the, the particular value. But but yeah, it, it just divides it up. So between like here and here. Um, I mean that that's going to be the the decision boundary, like from here to here, and 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 it's going to make, be making a prediction of uh, that level um, from here to here on the um, um, uh, the feature, right? And you know, that since we limited the tree a lot, you know, it's got a big one here, so from here to here, um, it makes a, a prediction of you know, whatever that is, point three nine or something. So it might not look like it's going to do too well, but um, if you, you know, um, uh, increase the depth, of course, you'll get better. So it'll make smaller and smaller um, subdivisions of your feature, right? So, um, so if you don't specify any regularization uh, using the default ham uh, hyperparameters, um, it, it'll keep going until it gets leaf nodes down to like a Gini of zero. So if you do that, you know, you get something like this. So, so it, every single point in the training data, or should be like every single point, um, I think most of all of these should have, should have seemed like something coming right to each one of these points. I'm not certain if it's just the visualization or something else, but um, 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is probably badly approached. So again, remember, this, this is really just a smooth quadratic with some noise in there, right? So, um, so that probably is overfitting there. We use a more reasonable, um, so, so 10 is probably still kind of underfitting a bit, maybe. Um, if we use. Here we're using like minimum point over for the leaf nodes. Um, Um, it might look like it got worse there. It was, it was 10 before, right? Hmm. Um, oh, um, um, yeah, in this case, right, uh, if you make it bigger, um, that's actually giving more regularization. So, um, so, so yeah, of course, the, 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 the um, if you go down to one, I mean, it's basically going to be unconstrained again. Right, so, so yeah, maybe I've got a max depth, probably illustrate better what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, so again, that's quite too much. Well, you can play around with that. So, hmm. it's still kind of more than I was thinking it would be. So. Yeah, anyway, so, yeah. so that's. Um, um, that's that's it for decision trees. Um, so let's let's look at ensembles a little bit real quickly here as well. I don't think I'll go over all this unless anybody wants to ask a question about kind of decision trees. Decision trees. I mean, before I go on from these, is, is uh, like I said, the, 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 in some ways maybe you know there would be a, actually a good first one to start with. Although you know I usually like to start with uh, linear regression because then we can introduce the concepts of like, you know, cost functions and um, uh, do an, an optimization search to minimize the cost function, right? Because lots of stuff, even decision trees are, are using that same kind of uh, uh, thing, right? But, you know, kind of that white boxy idea makes it um, attractive to a lot of people, you know, so you can much better understand what it's doing, how it's making its decision um, often. Um, all right, so I already mentioned, you know, so a, a common type of ensemble is just to have multiple um, decision trees, right? So the question then is, that, you know, that, that's talked about in, in our chapter about ensembles from our textbook. Is um, so if you have multiple uh, uh, classifiers or multiple machine learning models, how do you combine their um, results into a single prediction, right? So for a classifier, I mean, you know, you can you can probably think of some ideas on your own. So uh, an obvious one is to do some sort of voting, right? So if I have three classifiers, um, I take the the majority, right? If I have three classifiers that are doing binary classification, they all have to give either the zero or the one. So there's got to be a majority in that case. So, um, if I have three classifiers for, um, although, you know, I, I think I've probably said similar things to this like before. Um, so, so often you might want to use like soft voting. So you might, might want to use classifiers that make predictions that have some predictions of like how confident they are. So then you're going to use a weighted vote, right? So, so this classifier was very confident, so, so it would get a, a higher um, 
consideration when, when you're combining using some sort of voting mechanism to uh, the other classifier that had a lower confidence in its prediction. Um, So the basic idea though for to make ensembles good is you really need them to have variety, right? So, so the, the, the more homogenous, the more similar are the classifiers um, in the ensemble, the less useful it's gonna be because they're all gonna be basically given the same predictions and you don't gain anything, right? So um, um, if you can use different kinds of classifiers or if you're using like an ensemble of the same kind of classifier like an ensemble of trees, uh, you wanna do, do mechanism, different mechanisms so that um, um, they will end up um, training on different parts of the data set. Um, so, you know, these different things. So, so you might use, you might use different random um, portions of the data set to train uh, the different trees with. Um, and you might try, you know, right, changing those metaparameters. Um, so using uh, different values of metaparameters. Um, for different uh, tree classifiers in your ensemble. So, um, all right, okay, so yeah, it's, uh, if you just take the majority vote, um, when that's possible to do, um, that's known as a hard voting classifier. Um, So um, yeah, you should read our textbook um, about some intuitions on why ensembles can often do better. You know, it has to do with the ideas that you may or may not have run across, you know, like the, the, um, the wisdom of crowds, that kind of thing. So, so often, again, it really depends on having a, a more of a broad base. So the more homogenous, the, the more the similar the classifiers are, the less value you get out of ensemble. So if you can do something to, to create um, a, um, um, a, a lot of variety in the classifiers, uh, you might end up getting um, some, some strength, some benefits out of uh, doing ensemble um, uh, classification here, right? So if it's sufficiently diverse here, so. Um, For example, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go through all this in detail. So here, in this quick example, we're flipping uh, an unbalanced um, coin, which um, I don't remember, but um, um, the head ratio we're using is like 51%. So 51% of the time, it'll come up heads, 49% of the time, tails, right? Um, So you, you'll see if you run, create a bunch of uh, separate um, um, decision models here, you get all kinds of results including above and below, right? But uh, so, so the true uh, uh, value um, is 51% is here. If you ensemble all of these, right? So uh, add them all together, you'll see that it converges pretty closely to the correct one, whereas individual ones uh, tend to be above and below here. So, um, So yeah, in this case, we're, we're creating 10 of these um, uh, predictors here. That's the, the num flippers. Um, 
and, and basically they're, they're they're trying to estimate the, the the ratio by flipping the unbalanced coin ten thousand times, right? So so initially uh, for the first few ten or hundred flips, their estimate of the heads ratio, you know, is going to be um, have a lot more variety variation, right? That was why you're seeing this. As they go on, individuals though um, will be further away. So, so these individuals of, the, of these ten flippers, you know, um, you know, they vary around the true value of 0.51, right? You know, some, some are closer, some are further away, right? So just from the the um, this is kind of a kind of random walk here, right? But you know, again, if you ensemble, we take the average of all ten of those, uh, you, you more quickly converge onto something pretty close to the true. Um, um, actual ratio that's governing what these models are trying to find out, predict here. All right, so yeah, I don't know if that example uh, helps too much or not, but but, uh, but that is getting at that idea, right? So that often, um, in this case, I mean, the, the, the flippers aren't all that um, you know, don't have a lot of variety, they're pretty homogenous, but, but still it's meant to kind of illustrate uh, this idea here. Um, so you can create various uh, ensembles like using uh, voting classification so um, again we we'll use we we'll use this in our tests um, like a moon data set so a, a, a bit um, um, of, a, of a binary classification task but um, you know so, so definitely you can't use any kind of linear model I mean, you have to have something more um, um, uh, non-linear Right, and, and depending on your parameters, uh, make it tougher or not, and how much overlap there is. But yeah, there's only two features here and two uh, two classes, right? Um, so in this case, you know, we're showing simple using a voting classifier where we create three classifiers, and so we use a logistic regression um, and a division tree and um, a support vector machine, right? Um, with a, um, um, a radial basis function kernel by default, right? Um, so yeah, if, if, you, if you plot the decision boundary, you see that we get this, this is really the decision boundary of the, the, the classifier. So, so building a voting classifier, you basically give it the list of the estimators, right? Uh, and you tell, you know, hard or soft voting. So here we're just taking a majority vote, which will work in this case um, easily enough for a binary classification task. Um, and we get this result, right? But you can compare the, the, the voting classifier to the individual results, which is what I think we do down here. Um, So um, if you just take one um, measure of the, um, the uh, performance uh, on the data that we trained with, so this isn't a real fair kind of thing, but, but, but you know, these were the accuracy that we were getting with our three. Um, in this case, you know, it's not, it's not impressive, but you should usually get a little bit of the performance um, benefit here from the voting classifier. So it'll, it'll do a little bit better, marginally, but... Um, 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 yeah, usually. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't always work if you do this, but depending on how kind of tough the data is. So. Um, if all the classifiers um, can estimate, you know, their confidence, the, the, their class probabilities, and their prediction. Um, um, you know, using a soft voting, right? So in this case, all three that we use um, uh, can um, specify 
can give a confidence or a probability, um, although support vector machines don't do it by default. So you have to tell it that you need to um, enable probability estimates. Um, if you do that, you, know, you can also do that to get a, a voting classifier um, using the soft voting. So it'll be weighted by their confidence that they do. You get a similar result in this example. Um, be plot off the decision boundary. Um, and as you can see, I mean, again, you know, it may be marginally better than the best one of the individuals, right? Um, um, but uh, oh, well, yeah, the performance went down a little bit for the, um, from the hard to the, to the soft voting here. So. Um, so there's lots of kind of terminology in uh, this realm of ensembles. So, so lots of people are doing these and using these. So yeah, bagging, boosting, um, pasting. Um, um, these are all talked a little bit about in our textbook, right? Um, so, um, so, so, um, if instead of using different types of classifiers, we want to try and build an ensemble of the same kind of classifier, we need to do something to try and uh, increase the diversity of the in individual classifiers in order to get any benefit from the um, uh, from the ensemble. So, so yeah, that's what bagging is about. So, what boot, uh, bootstrap aggregating, right? So, um, kind of a, a fancy way for saying um, Um, that we're just going to sample a subset of the data to, to train classifiers of the same type, right? So basically, and, and so using kind of bootstrapping, you know, we sample. So um, it is possible for training samples to be sampled multiple times uh, to train um, predictors, the same predictor or different predictors, right? Um, So yeah, in, in terms of, of bias, um, uh, trade off that we've talked about before, right? So, so when you when you do that, when you only train on part of the data that you have, um, the, the individual predictors will have a higher bias, um, um, which will get kind of more variety um, in your training classifiers. Uh, but then when you aggravate over all those, that should usually reduce that bias um, um, and variance in the final performance. So, um, so yeah, there's a real quick example. These, these probably come from our textbook, if I remember right. So, if you want it to do a bagging classifier using division trees, um, you can say, uh, so, so here, I mean, this, this is really building a random forest. Um, you know, so this is the essence of a random forest here. So we, we create 500 decision trees uh, using bagging here, um, where we take 100 samples from, um, um, I mean, you know, I don't remember how many points we generated in this made up data here, right? Um, but right, we'll get that as our result. Um, and notice, so that was about probably maybe a little bit better than anything we'd seen before. Previously, we are using the same data set here, right? So 
Uh, well, it's about the same, look, not, not quite as good as the best one that we saw before. But. Um, but again, you know, this is on the uh, you know, predictions on the, the, the data that we trained with, right? Um, um, So uh, yeah, so there's there's more kind of uh, variations or things. So here we uh, we do this with um, the so-called out of bag evaluation. So that that has some similarity to cross validation. Um, and you do it like this. So um, So let's, let's move on. So random forests um, is really just an ensemble of decision trees, pretty similar to what we just did kind of by hand with, with the bagging method. Um, um, so actually, yeah, I mean, I think that it's not similar. It's, it's really the same thing, right? So random forest classifier is a name for an ensemble of decision trees. Um, where, you know, the details, I mean, you know, use bagging or the, the bagging with other kinds of parameters or, or variations, right? So, um, Um, yeah, and, and you know, I don't, I don't know how much to go into some of the. There, there's lots of you know variations on these, you know. So, so again, if if um, diversity is having some problems, you can start doing things to try and make the the classifiers in your ensembles even more diverse, right? So, so you know, you can try, you know, instead of doing like a greedy optimization, you can start uh, doing things more randomly on your thresholds and things. You know, so instead of searching for the optimal threshold, like in the cart, um, 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 use some random randomization in your threshold there. So um, yeah, you know, so um, before I kind of read our textbook here, you know, I kind of ran across these extra tree classifiers in Scikit-Learn. So these are examples of, of um, um, basically a random forest uh, with this randomization, extremely randomized trees. So. Um, so I think I've mentioned this before. Um, So although I probably should have talked a little bit more about it when we talked about decision trees. So another use of decision trees is um, on estimating um, how important or unimportant features are. So when you build a decision tree, um, often the, the things that will get you the best um, performance, you know, so for your root node um, are gonna end up being split on, you know, features that are the most important for, you know, making decision boundaries, right? Um, so, so that's the, the, the fitness function that we describe for decision trees naturally does that. Um, so, so the things up at the, the root node or the higher nodes, or, you know, in general, probably be more important features than, than the ones that end up not being used until further down in the depth of the tree. So, um, so but if you want to be more um, certain about that, you can create multiple trees 
um, you know, like, like, you know, create like a random forest uh, using like maybe, you know, again, using um, a bagging or something to get some randomness in there. Uh, and then com compute the average depth at which um, features appear in the tree. And that will give you uh, an even better estimate of the importance um, that features might have on this classification task that you're working with. So, um, so that's actually built in. Um, so you can use that for random forest classifiers um, um, to get an estimate of the feature importance. So, so all this thing is described there. Uh, if you train a random forest classifier, um, it will do that. And that will be a feature that you can pull out, right? So you'll get um, a list of the features and kind of their importance. Um, so here, you know, it's saying pedal width uh, tends to be the most important feature followed by pedal length. Um, you can get some variation on that. I mean, this is random forest, so I guess it is possible when you run this to get the pedal length estimate slightly above um, pedal width. So, as I had written up there. Uh, so, yeah, you can see that they're slightly different. Yeah, yeah, and pedal length was just a little bit better than pedal width there. So. Um, So kind of finally, oh, well, yeah, there's boosting and stacking. So I didn't have a lot in here. So you can read our textbook about it. Um, so these are other things. So, so everything that we looked at before, kind of these ensembles was, was voting um, where you ensemble everything. So, so they all make their own classification. Then you do one um, final vote or one sign, final ensemble to make a prediction, right? So, so boosting is really where you do things um, in sequence instead of kind of all the decisions are made in parallel, right? So, um, um, so, so these are really interesting, but, but maybe a bit beyond the scope of, of our class here. But, um, you know, so the idea then is if you build a predictor um, that, that might be a weak learner, and then you build a predictor that uses the prediction of the previous one and tries to improve on it. Right, so in kind of the sequence there. So that's kind of how this uh, boosting works. And, and there are some um, um, uh, things in scikit-learn for doing those, um, you know, um, automatically for you. Data boosts, adaptive boosting, and gradient boosting. So. Um, So yeah, so, so stacking is also another kind of example of stacking where you're using um, um, an ensemble voter, um, you know, to, to have multiple things making like a vote. But then instead of just taking a simple vote, um, you train another classifier. So, so again, it's kind of a stacking. So, so you train another classifier to basically learn, you know, from, from the outputs. So, so maybe you get the prediction and the uh, probabilities as, as inputs uh, from your ensemble. Um, and, and then you train the classifier to use those as inputs to make um, its um, uh, final uh, prediction, right? So more sophisticated uh, kind of thing you're trying to do than voting. Um, all right, so yeah, that's that was kind of everything I wanted to cover um, here for today. Um, oh, so I did have a question here finally. Um, um, so somebody's asking um, if you can would need decision trees for um, non-tabular data. So for that, I mean, you can use decision trees, you know, for both classification and regression. So, uh, so, so I don't know if I 100% um, am, am quite getting at what you mean by non-tabular data. 
Um, so, so I mean, yeah, I mean, usually all machine learning data is in form of a table. So you got your rows um, are the, the samples. Um, so usually for your input, and then the columns are the features, right? So, um, I mean, in general, I don't know if you can do machine learning with something that's kind of like non-tabular. So, so mostly we do think of things uh, being laid out in general um, as a table. Um, um, so, so samples by features, right? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, what you, whatever you mean by non-tabular, I mean, if you can do it with logistic regression or something like that, you can do those uh, with decision trees as well. Right. So, you know, for decision tree, I mean, we were, we were using tabular, um, we were using tabular data for all of our examples, you know, so like the, um, um, the iris data set, of course, is, you know, we have 150 samples of, of, of flowers, of irises, uh, and we had four features, so four measurements for each of, of the ones, right? Um, um, Well, that, uh, if you're kind of still with me here, I don't know if that uh, answers or not, or if you can be a little bit more, um, um, describe a little bit more about what you're thinking about when you're talking about non-tabular data. So. Um, all right, so I think I'll go ahead and end the session here for now. Um, and, um, you know, as usual, as you're working on assignment four, let me know if you have questions on things, send emails, um, or um, be happy to, you know, meet with people if they need it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll go ahead and end this recording and I'll post it as usual. And I will see you guys later then.